All right, so we're we're still recapping everything that happened with the Heat in the finals. And we got NBA free agency coming up in a few weeks. We got the draft next week. So there's still a lot to do as far as the Heat go, but we're still getting over the finals loss a couple nights ago. Joining us here, former coach, of course, ESPN Radio. He was on the call with our guy Mark Kestisher, Doris Burke for the NBA Finals. What a crew. That's a very good radio team. PJ Carlissimo joining us here. Thank you, as always, for making time for us here, PJ. Uh, I, I want to start out, actually, with this Denver team, and, th and then we'll do a bunch of Heat stuff. Uh, I I felt going into the series, I thought the Heat were going to win. I felt they had a good chance. But after after game three, uh, the way that Jokic and Murray responded after the Heat won game two, they, they looked like a championship team to me, PJ, at that point. I, I think they were, uh, Zaz, and I think that Testy and I happened to be doing the Western Conference for – ESPN. So we saw them, you know, we, we saw them more. We saw the Lakers series. We saw bits of other pieces, Doris and Dave Pash for the most, they had the Eastern conference finals. Now Doris, of course, was jumping around with TV before that, but um, <laughs> she knew the heat better than we did. We knew Denver a little bit better uh, having seen them so many times what they, I mean, obviously they had two great players. Uh, it's still, I think one of the best side things about the entire finals was pretty much our national audience seeing Jokic. I mean, I don't know how you can be a two-time MVP, and yet the truth was we don't we didn't have him on as much as we should have. I, I'm sure you could say the same thing about Turner. Um, the guy is is phenomenal, and I think you know more people realize that now after after seeing the finals. Jamal Murray was just he was lost for two years, and and I think people had kind of forgotten about him or just assumed, hey, with those injuries. He, you know, he's going to be lucky to come back and play, much less play at the level he did. So I think there was a little bit of surprise, actually, how just how good they were. It was easier for us to see. I live out in Seattle. I do more Western usually than Eastern. They were the best team in the West since probably since December. It wasn't like it was all smooth sailing early. But from December on, they were the clear cut best team in the West. They were the clear-cut best team in the playoffs also. They they did go six games with Phoenix, but if you looked at games five and six, it was like, whoa. Um, they had the, they have the ability to step up. They had the second-best home record in the league. They obviously had that going for them also. Every team other than Miami, that would be a major problem. Miami doesn't seem to care about playing at home or playing on the road, but uh, they had so many things going for them. And, and probably the biggest thing, um, Jonathan, and you may have talked about it. I did not hear it talked about one time during the finals. I, I say every year, I was lucky enough to sit next to Pop for three years. The team that wins every year is usually very lucky health-wise. You know, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Nobody says anything. When you have extremes, when you have Kevin Durant and Clay Thompson getting hurt uh, in the finals, everybody goes, oh, well, they didn't have their whole team. But if you look, there's a lot of years – that either the runner-up or a team maybe that it was even as just as good all year, but their guys weren't healthy in May and June, and that's huge. No one made a big enough deal, I didn't think, out of Tyler Hero not playing, or Vic, nor Victor Oladipo. When you look at Denver's roster, Denver's roster was there. They started the same team the entire playoffs. They had a couple little dings. You weren't sure if a guy was going to play a certain game or not, but that's enormous and it's enormous every year uh, in the finals. I mean, virtually every year. If you go back and look and say, you know, what happened to these guys? They had the second best record and they got beat right away. Well, guess what? One of their best kept. Kevin Love was involved in that, excuse me, yep. when he was in Cleveland. So it's huge. Everybody, you know, toward the end, is Tyler going to play? Is Tyler not going to play? Forget that. Even if he could have played, I question when you take seven weeks off, uh, almost anybody, particularly a shooter, uh, it, it's difficult. But And, you know, you, you don't make excuses for the Heat. If there's ever a team that doesn't make excuses or doesn't need them, it's the Miami Heat. But Tyler Hero not playing and Victor Oladipo not playing was major. We're not talking, you know, two-way uh, two, two -way players or somebody yep. that wouldn't have made a difference. They would have made a huge difference were they healthy. You know, I think I think a lot of the NBA world, the fans around the country, especially the East Coast, and certainly the Miami Heat fans, we got a front row seat to Nikola Jokic 
when you, when obviously, like you said, they were not on television enough nationally. And of course, because they're a Western Conference team, we only see them twice a year. I think everyone was now indoctrinated to this Nikola Jokic. I mean, PJ, he's impossible. He, he doesn't miss around the basket. And, and obviously, if you come and double him, which the Heat did not do a ton of, but if you come and double him, he, the vision is incredible. He, he was impossible, PJ, the whole series. But he, he is, and again, I, it's us. It's our fault. It's ABC and ESPN. That's who I work for. Uh, and it's Turner to an extent. Um, Turner had to have him on more than we did, but um, it, it, it's – he makes it look easy, but he's the kind of guy that you genuinely, genuinely enjoy going to watch him play because you're going to see some things that most people can't do. And he's deceptive when you first see him. And when he first came into the league, frankly, he had to get he had to he had to lose some pounds, he had to trim up a little bit, but he did all that. He he plays enormous minutes, and he's still going strong at the end. And he plays in Denver. And as much as people talk, altitude does make a difference. But right now, he's in his good shape. As anybody in the league, he can play 42, 45 minutes and still be making three-point shots and getting up and down the floor. He's deceptively athletic, John. He doesn't look – you never look at him and say, oh, wow, he's cut. Look at him. He's unbelievable. But he is compared to what, the way he came into the league. Right. And every guy to a man, when you see him, there's not a more athletic defender than Bam Adebayo in the league. But every once in a while, you'll see a play during a thing like a loose ball – and all of a sudden, he's got this other gear that he can go get to it, or he can get back on defense. He can run the floor on offense. He brings it up. Sometimes he's bringing it up with his left hand. And the smaller players, like, next to him trying to catch it. Like, it's not like the guy's blowing by him. He's still going down the floor and making decisions. So he's he's scary good. I, I really – I felt good for him and Michael Malone in particular because I, I don't think – Again, it's it sounds impossible, but I really believe it. You can be a two time MVP, and the average fan didn't didn't have any idea. I ran my mouth the whole time after the voting, saying, "I don't know how you can vote for Joel Embiid. He had a great year. Giannis had a great year. If you watch this kid game in and game out, there's no doubt who impacts the game more, what he means to his team. So I was happy for him. I was happy for Michael Malone because a lot of people didn't realize. Just I mean, he. This is the first one, and and I can I think he will continue to do well. But it's funny they had the, they had the stat. You can make stats say anything, but the four teams that had the most wins the last five years in the NBA were the Bucks. Again, why Bud's not coaching anymore? Even though my my guy Adrian Griffin from Seton Hall is, but it was Bud, Spo, uh, Denver, and and Golden State. So they've been there. But they, they had never cracked in. So Michael Malone, I think, was tied with Steve going into that last game. That was his 37th playoff win in the last five years. So he's third behind Mike Budenholzer and Eric Spolster in wins, playoff wins the last five years. That's how good a coach he is that, again, most people don't realize. Like you mentioned with the Heat, they're a no-excuse team. You heard Jimmy after the series and before the games, there's nothing wrong with my ankle. I'm totally fine. Uh, no excuse players, no excuse team. They never, they rarely complain. It's it's some of the things I really love about them. You know, they're very business-like. They just, we're playing basketball here. So I find that quality very likable. But what did you make of Jimmy's performance in the finals? Because it really did seem there had to be something going on there. Right, PJ? Well, again, this is how smart I am, Zaz. Right before, I think it was late third quarter, uh, D.B. Doris and I kept talking about, hey, Jimmy's playing well for most human beings, right. but he's not playing Jimmy Butler good. And she said he does not have the lift. He looks different. Every time out, he had one of those hydrocolator heat, heat pads on his arm. And I, I finally came out and said, not that he needed an excuse, but like I said, people got to realize there's something wrong with Jimmy Butler. He's not going to say it. The team is not saying it. Either his leg's not right or his right arm is not right. I don't know what it is. And I was so happy because I saw him walking out. When, when we went out and exited, we, we happened to go by the heat locker room and Jimmy was out front. And I still kid him that his coming out party was against us when I was coaching Brooklyn and he was in Chicago. He was already a good player, but that was his first really big playoff. They beat us in seven and came down to Miami to play uh, LeBron and, and uh, the Heat the next 
They won the first game, as a matter yeah. of fact. I, mean, I think they, the Heat came back, probably won the next four. Yeah. But I always kid Jimmy. I said, if you didn't light us up, man, that started your career. So, you know, I've, I've known him a long time and have a good relationship. I told him, I said, I thought you played great. I said, I, I, I didn't think you were 100%. I thought you played great. You didn't make any excuses. And then he comes out after I say that, say he's not right. He gets 13 points in the fourth quarter. It's like, what are you talking about? But again, I, 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 I don't, in my heart, I don't believe. I don't know if that's right. I don't know if the Heat have said anything since then. But you'll never convince me that he was 100%. Uh, that, that wasn't – it was impressive, great Jimmy Butler. He, he was tremendous, but it wasn't Jimmy Butler 100%. Totally. I think. Uh, I to think. Totally. I totally agree. Uh, one of the things I have liked about this postseason, and we've noted down here for a very, very long time, Eric Spolstra is phenomenal. And I feel like finally, for the first time, going into all these games, you would hear people say, Spo's going to do this. Spo's going to figure out this. Spo's going to counter this. Spo's out coaching this. And that's an easy thing for fans to say. One coach is out coaching the other one. But I feel like really for the first time, it is being acknowledged that this guy is, I mean, just at the top of the game, PJ. Couldn't agree more. He, Spo and his staff, and again, same thing, he deflects all that. And rightfully so. It's a very, very talented staff. I mean, uh, uh, as you well know, with, with Riles and Andy in charge and Spoke, because Spoke now really belongs in that de decision-making group. Uh, and, and, and by the way, the fact that Nick and Mickey don't interfere, it's kind of interesting, the two guys that were there. You had two, two Spoke's been there, what, is it 15 years now? Head coach for but, 15, yeah. But I mean... Yeah. Do Mickey and Nikki care? Yeah. Do they interfere? No. Do the Cronkies care? Absolutely. But when Tim Conley was there, they let him do it. Now they're letting Calvin Booth run the team. Michael Malone's been there, and they didn't like say, hey, this is taking longer than it should. They stayed with Michael Malone, and it was great to see two of the uh, four, uh, I'm going to say oldest, uh, most years experience in the league yeah. were in the finals. And, they, and they're both relatively young guys by NBA standards. But it was great to see – in my opinion, and of course I'm prejudiced as an uh, old coach, former seeing two teams stay with their guy, allowing him to grow. Spo was – when you sit on the opposite bench, and, and even to an extent when you when you broadcast, because one of the interesting things about us nationally, uh, ESPN, whether it's TV or radio and, and Turner, we have entree into practices and shoot arounds and things like that, that, you know, you don't see when you're a coach sitting on the other bench, you know what they're doing. You watch their tapes. You have to sit there and, and react to what they're doing. But when you get a chance to go in, uh, we have entree that you don't get as a, as a, as a coach when you're the opposite coach. Um, suppose not good. He's great. And he's been great for a long time. People did not realize that in the yeah. beginning. Uh, the job he did with, with I thought, in the championships were unbelievable. But what he's done since then, it's even more. People now know, like when you say best coaches in the NBA, suppose right there. Uh, and, you know, you're splitting hairs. You're talking one, two, three, four. I mean, come on. He is one of the best. They're lucky to have him. Um, I happen to like, too. And it's a person – it has nothing to do with how good a coach he is. But it did this year. Uh, I just love the way – he's businesslike, and you don't, you don't get the song and dance. Um, uh, three guys are out tonight. You were in foul trouble yesterday. Never. You had this yeah. go against you. We, we could have done. We, we could have done this. We could have done something better. Totally no excuse. The team has totally bought into that, and exactly you get the exact same thing from them. So it's it's beautiful to watch. But uh, I I just love Spo like Bud when I like the San Antonio video room there's more guys have come out of that video yeah. room and, and long ago people didn't appreciate it now you got bud and spo and frank vogel there are so many guys in the league now that started in the video room and people are like like there's no stigma anymore no he's not a former he is a, a college player but he never played in the nba and and he was in one place the whole time which a lot of people say well he's always been there yeah guess what because they're smart uh, and, okay. and, have kept, and have kept him there. It, it's again, it was great to see. And um, I thought in the bubble, the thing that we missed, uh, it was great covering the bubble. But again, this, the same thing down there. You know, sometimes you kind of felt like you were operating there and you wondered how many people were actually watching or not. Right. And when you got a chance to talk with those coaches, even though in, in, in the bubble, we couldn't go to practices or shoot arounds or really sit down. Everything was like us right now talking. It, it doesn't feel quite the same, but um, 
I can guarantee you this. Any coach in the league that sits on the opposite bench and has to deal with whether it's the matchups, the, the changing defenses, the, the multitude of things that the Heat do and do very, very well. Uh, there's enormous, enormous respect for Spo and what he does. You know, a whole thing was made throughout the playoffs during this Heat run about the undrafted guys, Gabe Vincent, Max Cruz, Duncan <laughs> Robinson, all of it. Do other teams, do other front offices or, or owners, are other owners around the league saying to their general managers, why aren't we finding all of the, like, what is Miami doing different than us? Are other teams talking like that? For sure. Some in a nice way, some not so nice. I know if I was an owner, I'd be calling me and saying, hey, year in, year out, these guys keep finding these players. And and frankly, there's a dialogue. We're doing the draft uh, next week. And I said, uh, there's going to be more interest for that 41st pick. When we get to 41, I forget what number Manu was drafted at in San Antonio. It was kind of the same thing. People, they knew early how good he was, and it took a, a, an extra year to get him over there. I said, people might be a little more interested now in, in some of these late picks saying, hey, Giannis, some of these MVPs were drafted in the second round. What's going on? Or, you know, it's um, – I would think they're saying it, and I would think they're not saying it in a nice way. You have one guy doing it or two guys doing it, you say, okay, they got lucky with a guy. When there's seven guys on the roster that are undrafted, you say, hey, guys, like, what are we not doing that they're doing? We have as many guys working. Um, you got to give Chad and Chad. You got to give – it starts with the – and the scouting with the cameras. But, again, it's been happening too long in Miami. Yep. And, you know, I, I'm sure some people say, come on, like you're giving – you're talking about if, – if you don't think it starts with Pat Riley and that whole culture, you're crazy. But it's those individuals, and whether it's uh, Chad or Chad or Andy or whomever, they do a better job. And the other thing they do, similar to what they, we talked about, what both these franchises have done with Spo and Michael Malone, they're patient. Yeah. You know, they get some guys that are two ways, and and they started, they, they even went away, or they went down to G League and they came back, and you never really thought he was going to be a good player. Gabe Vincent's probably, to me, the best example. And, and you see him, you go back to – not being drafted where he was playing, belonged, I, I think belonged to the Kings originally and whatever, whoever it was, or I might be confusing him with Keller, but uh, he was there. Yeah, he played a little bit. I kind of liked him, but, you know, he, he, he's never going to help us. Boom, an injury, opportunity. The guy's been there three or four years. Why is this guy so good? Because he's been in the system, because yeah. they identified him as being able to contribute. Maybe not today, maybe not next year, but eventually. Um, it, it's a... Uh, it's a it's a really impressive um, organization the way they work, but particularly in terms of the players they they unearth in a G League or D League or Europe or w w wherever it is the two way players uh, they got some guys on the bench like some of those other seven people don't even know their names don't don't even know who they were I'm not saying who somebody from that group's going to turn out two or three years from now to be a very good player people are going to go you know who is he and Oh yeah, well that's right. He was on that. He was on that championship team, but he didn't get a chance to play. But um, they're they're very patient, and they're great with their player development. Uh, and I, I tell you, I love also. It's not. It's the second criteria, and I know I know Riles, and I know the people there too well. But they take care of their own. When they have somebody who's really talented, they keep him in the organization. Like let's UD is a perfect example. Um, but I mean, it, it's it's not just oh we're going to be nice because because he played for us. Uh, uh we're going to be nice because he played for us and he's very talented. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they're contributing and they're part of that culture. So it's a uh, no question. Um, it's really impressive and it's not by accident that it continues to happen. Now next week, PJ, like you mentioned, I believe it's Thursday night, uh, mm -hmm. NBA draft, ESPN radio. You'll be on the coverage, and then short. So there's going to be some stuff happening draft night, like there normally is, and then. About two weeks after that, you got the free agency. Uh, I'm getting the sense, and I'm wondering if you are, this might be a wild off season for the NBA. Yeah, I, th I think so. Well, again, they, they've changed the league. And it's funny, like, I'm I'm going to a primer on it right now. I mean, during the year, I always depend on Bobby Marks or our other guys to say, all right, here's, here's what teams have, free agents, here's the resign, what they can do. They're limited. They're over the cap. These uh, tax levels, umbrellas, whatever the hell they're talking about. I got to learn in the next five days. I'm still not going to be right on top of it, but the combination of 
what's going on now with these maxes and super maxes and, and the tax uh, and, and the penalties, uh, it's going to be very interesting. And I think there's going to be wheeling and dealing some before the draft, um, some things after, you know, how it is sometimes I, I used to hate, it's a small thing, but I used to hate in the draft when I was coaching, we'd have our guys come up and put the hat on for the wrong team. And you'd say, Oh, guy, I hate it. Guy's, not, I hate guy's it. not going there, but oh. there's no, they do a better job now of trying to get it done. <laughs> but we, we've had more guys that we knew were not our guys. And he, he's there with our hat and they're saying nice things. And uh -huh. meantime, we're calling the other guy going, Hey, the deal's done as soon as the NBA get, but it is what it is. But um, I, I just think there will be, there's going to be, uh, Yes, a little, a few changing hats uh, probably on <laughs> Thursday, but more rosters changing uh, because people know that, that they're coming up upon a contract that the guy's going to be able to get somewhere else that they can't give him, and uh, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to to see how things change. the The biggest one, I think, for Denver, which a lot of people might not have appreciated until the last couple of games, is Bruce Brown. I mean, that, that there's more, I swear there's more, and I'm not, they're both good friends of mine, Sean Marks in Brooklyn and who, uh, you know, all the people making the decisions in uh, Los Angeles. It seems there's more Lakers and Nets, former Lakers and former Nets playing for these other teams going, why'd they let this guy go? This guy's unbelievable. Bruce Brown is really good. I, I know that the Heat fans know that, Yep. but it's going to be a challenge for them to get him. I don't know. I don't know if there's a, there's always a way, but it's, it's going to be tough. And, Talk about an important element of that team, no question about it. I mean, you know, when the, we kept going into game, I mean, they were doing it with Max a little bit and Gabe when he had the two off games. But Michael Porter Jr., we kept saying, this guy's three for 22 in, in three-point shooting. And KCP, for the most part, had a tough series in terms of putting the ball in the basket. And yet Bruce Brown's coming off the bench. Christian Brown, the rookie who was fan. Bill Self was there. I was kidding him. I said, boy, he, you know, he's something else. And um, Jeff Green, the old veteran, I, yeah. I actually coached my, our last year. I'm sitting in Seattle where we live. We had KD and Jeff after the Ray Allen trade as rookies, and he's still going strong. Yep. I mean, he, he had a couple of games where it really mattered, you know, what he did. So, um, yeah, when you, in terms of these two teams, hey, there's nothing wrong with our roster. If we're healthy, we, we, we can make a run. Yeah, well, guess what? Here's who we can keep. Here, it's going to be hard to keep. And when you're when you're right there near the top, which both teams are right now, the run that Miami was on, the teams they beat, those teams got to be saying, "What the hell's going on?" You know, Boston. We were in the finals last year. Uh, we had this incredible comeback, and we got annihilated in Game Seven in our own building. So, um, you know, to run through Milwaukee and Boston and New York, uh, and and to play as well as they played. With, in my opinion, a guy and a half out for sure. I mean, I know Victor's been hurt for a while, but um, Jamal Murray was out two years. When yep. Jamal Murray was able to come back, he was extremely productive. So, um, you know, let's let's wait and see what happens. But it, 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 we we were in Denver. We were right next to the the Heat bench. But you know, even going to the, the shoot arounds and the, the the press offerings, you know, I keep seeing uh, Tyler Hero in the goofy hat, whatever the hell that kind of hat. <laughs> right, is a bucket hat. And, the way he had bucket hat and the way he dresses during the game, I'm saying, man, uh, some this guy scores 20 points a game. Yeah. I've seen this guy play in the finals before. I mean, yeah. he's sitting there in the bucket hat, and I, you know, I never even saw Victor. So it's uh, it, it's tough. But again, that's part of the game. But it's a big part of teams winning championships. It, re it really is. Lastly, here, PJ. Again, PJ's on the coverage. NBA, ESPN Radio, the draft next Thursday night. How soon after the draft lottery? Did you phone Coach Popovich, and can you tell me anything about that conversation? Well, the language, uh, unfortunately, the language when Pop and I get on the phone is usually not good. And I, and I got to say, if I had one impact on Pop, it probably was to make his language even worse um, when, when he talks with me. But, um, yeah, I, I, I was kidding him. He was actually, after we went over to France and then he was in Italy, he sent me a text like, hi, I, I'm in Italy and you're not. And uh, I, gave, I gave him a call when we were talking about Victor. You know, what I said is there's no question how incredibly lucky that team is. But I'll tell you what, how incredibly lucky I think, and I'm prejudiced, but I think incredibly lucky for Victor. I mean, he could not have asked for a better guy to break in with and a better place to be where you're kind of off the beaten track. I loved it for five years, but uh, I think it's going to be a great situation for Pop. He liked it. This was their 50th anniversary. I did. I went back and did three games for them 
It was a road trip at Chicago, at Toronto, and at Detroit. And talking about health, four of the five starters missed all three games. The young kids, so on. And uh, I'll tell you what, um, they have some good young players. And Pop like coaching these two teams, which is kind of crazy. Um because, I mean, you're talking to a guy that, that has won 60 yeah. or almost 70 games and and however many championships I've lost count, I think five. five. Um, he liked the teams. He enjoyed the coaching. And like people said to me, you think he's going to hang it up? I said, this is before Victor. I said, no. I, I said, he really still enjoys coaching. If he gets to the point where he doesn't, sure, he'll, he'll give it up. He obviously doesn't need to do it, but he enjoys it. And I think this is just – going to read like everybody said, well, he's going to coach for sure. And I said, I'm, I, you know what? I think he was going to coach anyhow, but this one is going to reinvigorate. Right. And it's going to be interesting to see what he and RC and, and their front office does, because they, they probably have too many young guys to be really good, but they're, they're a little closer when they're healthy uh, than, than people think. I mean, there's a couple of the, I actually think it's gotten almost to the point where the East got a little deeper. It used to be real obvious. There was a couple of great teams in the East mm -hmm. and the West was much deeper. It's almost flipped. Now, you know, I think there's a couple of teams. Um, if Phoenix sorts out what they're doing with KD, talking about health, if the Warriors figure out, <laughs> excuse me, who they're keeping and what they're going to be. But I think the depth now in the East is incredible. Yeah. I think Spurs could make a run next year. They're not going to win it. But I think they're going to be a little more – could be a little more competitive, particularly if they can add a, a veteran piece or two uh, because it, it's scary how young they are. I mean, traveling with them for a week, for five days, I'm just shaking my head going, wow. I mean, they they were better. People always say that if it's a bad team. They say, oh, it's a G League team. No, they're not a G League team. But I'll tell you what, they're pretty good. Uh, very good young players that – need experience, but it's it's going to be tough. I'm dying to see him play game in and game out because yeah. everybody's as over the years. I don't care who it is. LeBron might have been the exception, and this kid probably does. I, I hate to put that on a kid when it starts, but everybody says this. No one says, yeah, but anytime you talk to anybody that's yeah. seen him multiple times, they go, he's unbelievable. You're like, wait till you see him. You're not going to believe it. He's <laughs> He is that good. And there's only a couple of those guys. Uh, you know, it, Duncan didn't always get that kind of recognition because he wasn't flashy, but there's only a couple of those transcendent guys that from the day they were drafted, everybody knew they were going to be good. Everybody knew they were probably going to be in fight. Like Giannis, people didn't know that about Giannis. Right. People didn't know it about Joker. Now they laugh and say, of course, if you got Giannis, you, you're going to go to finals. You're going to, you're going to win championships. Joel Embiid, people didn't know it about. Um, this kid, they've been saying it for a long time. And to a man, everybody says the same thing. Yes, he is that good. So can the Spurs I, I can the Spurs not take the whole clock? When Adam Silver says the Spurs are on the clock, can he also have the card in his hand? Yeah, that would be great. I would love to see that <laughs> once in a while. You know, once in a while. Uh, and, and they're going to get the hat right on this one. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he will probably have a San Antonio Spurs hat on. Uh, and it'll fit him, so it'll be nice. PJ, excellent job. I really appreciate you spending time with us here. Uh, enjoy the draft and, of course, the offseason. I appreciate you. Thank you, Jonathan. It's great to be with you. Appreciate it.